Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the Winners Academy. Uh, throughout this edition, we said we would have six webinars, and today is number five, it's the fifth one, but we may have surprises, who knows, later um, later throughout next month. I can't believe already we are going to be in the month of March soon. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce our Winners Academy team. Today we have our brilliant district PR manager, Hanan Borihi. She started her journey with Toastmasters in June 2018 and joined to improve her English. However, she discovered many talents that she had at both as a speaker and leader. Uh, she has held various leadership positions within the club and was also an area director. And today she will help us as a timer. And hosting the show is our one and only <laughs> Isidro. Uh, he started his Toastmasters journey in 2017 and became a district champion several times in a row. He reached the final of the world champion of public speaking in 2021, is also a TEDx speaker, and is currently the Division D director. Isidro, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Hanan. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Francisco, for coming. Today, we will learn the speed multiplier. I don't know what it is yet. You don't know what it is yet, but we will very soon. Who is Francisco? Francisco Dis Martins discovered Toastmasters through a speech craft organized by the Invicta Toastmasters Club in January 2018. By April of the same year, he became a member of the club. The first time he stepped onto the stage to deliver a speech, he stuttered and forgot half his speech. However, thanks to the valuable feedback received at Toastmasters, he secured the first place in the Portuguese speech contest in our district last year. Fellow Toastmasters, ladies and gentlemen, Francisco Martins. Thank you, Isidro. Uh, just says here, I the host is able participant screen sharing. I am unable to share my screen. Sorry for that. Now you can. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see my screen? Let me know, please. Okay. Yes. Supp supposed to say Toastmasters International. So if it is appearing on your, on your screens, that's a big plus, and it means I'm ready to start my presentation about the speech multiplier. Like Isidro said, you are going to find out what it is. But is it one multiplier or many? Let's find out. Well, Isidro already told you who I am, but uh, just to reaffirm, I'm Francisco Martins since 1991, which was the year I was born. Uh, I'm an electronics engineer since 2015. I'm a member of Invicta Toastmasters Club uh, since 2018, and I won the Portuguese speech contest last year in District 107. Now, I was contacted to do a workshop and a workshop about crafting and delivering a contest speech. And I really liked the, the idea of having done in the future a workshop about this. And But since I had to prepare it, I thought, how hard can it be? And then I started to panic. What am I going to talk? What am I going to say? I have no idea what to talk about. Sure, I had a winning speech, but it was thanks to all the feedback I got and uh, many improvements I made along the way. But... Then I stopped to think about it, about what made my speech special. And I came up with the gist of the speech, the emotion of the speech, the message, and the quirkiness. And to all these four pillars, I call the multipliers, the speech multipliers. And now you are thinking, oh, multipliers, am I back in math class? Oh, no. But don't worry. 
the only thing you have to know about math and toast and toastmasters is that each multiplier that i'm going to present multiplies the potential of your speech let's start with the first one the gist or the essence if it's more easy to follow and to answer the question of what is the gist of a speech we have to ask a very simple question what is your, what is your speech about what is the essence of the speech what is the theme and more importantly what is the elevator pitch the elevator pitch for those that don't know is the idea that if you meet someone in an elevator you have to sell them an idea as fast as possible so so what is it sorry i'm hearing a bit of an echo test test no oh, it's fixed uh so you can uh so what is your speech about like i was saying it can be about sharing information inspiring others it can be a call to arms and you can even attempt to make someone laugh or cry and they all can be separate topics but you can you can even mix them all together to form a really rich speech so how do you choose the gist the essence of your speech sorry i won't be answering that question i'll will answer i'll try to answer a different one how not to choose the gist of the speech now do you feel uncomfortable when someone you know is uh, telling a story and you feel left out because he's just telling a bit of some details and you have the impression that you had to be there to understand the whole story that the way your friend or your colleague is talking about his experience is not enough is not expressing enough about his experience to make you understand it and feel included or does it feel uncomfortable when you are in school or at work and you have a problem and you ask your more experienced colleague or the best student in class to help you out with something and they starting they start to overexpose and overexplain all these concepts that you don't know about and it comes a point where you start to understand pretty much nothing because you are overloaded with too much information or even does it feel uncomfortable when you hear someone just talking about all the things they did, all the amazing things they did, they bought, all the amazing place they traveled to, and they talk in such a way that you start to feel inferior to them? Of course, these are uncomfortable situations. And what this causes is if you speak in the ways I described, you don't allow yourself to be approachable relatable friendly and it makes it hard for the audience to connect with you because they feel excluded yeah exactly you you don't want to be that person you want to do something else and so you need to know what is not a good gist a good gist for example is a story that only those who had a similar experience can utterly understand. Like the example I gave you with a colleague that gives you the impression, the typical impression that, oh, you had to be there to understand it. You don't want to do a speech where you leave the audience with this feeling. What is not a good gist? An informative speech where you assume the audience has the same experience as you. For those of, uh, of you that are teachers, you know that when you try to explain something to your students, you have to understand what they might not know and speak from a point where you lower yourself to someone that doesn't know anything about what you're talking about, and you start from the bottom. You start from the scratch. It's important to know if you are able to connect with the audience by explaining something hard or complex in a simple way and what is not the gist 
like I said before, an expose on all the things that make you better than others. Nobody likes a show off. More importantly, nobody likes to feel inferior to someone that is showing off. So even if you want to talk about something that it was really amazing for you, an achievement for you, you don't want to share with the audience that experience in a way that makes them feel inferior. And I hope that this makes you get the gist of the gist. Moving on, we have the second multiplier, which is the emotion. And for this multiplier, I have another question. What do you want others to feel? And uh, well, you might want others to feel a variety, a plethora of emotions. Like you want, you want the audience to be happy, sad, conflicted, or even disturbed, if you want that. But how will you achieve that emotion? How will you make the audience feel what you want them to feel? You might want to make them laugh, make them cry, make them think about something, and so on. But here's the funny part. Do you focus to achieve this? Do you focus on what you have to say? So you tell a joke or you tell a tragic story. Do you focus on how you are going to say what you want to say? Like trying to use a really silly voice or shouting. Or do you focus on where is the most appropriate time in your speech to say it? Like an introduction, a conclusion, in the middle of, of your speech, so on. Or, instead of all I just said, you just focus on yourself. And I know, I know, now some of you are thinking, oh no, this is not a workshop, this is a coaching session. Nothing like that, just bear with me. On yourself, yeah, exactly on focus on yourself and what does it mean it means you need to focus on how you feel during your speech because of the funny thing about human beings is that we are empathic creatures and we react to the emotions of others and if you emote in a way in the way that you want others to feel they will catch up on that and like I said, if I'm happy and I show that I'm happy, possibly, if there's nothing wrong with the audience, they will feel happy as well. If I start to cry on stage, well, people might not start to cry, but surely they won't be happy about it, and so on. So to make the audience feel what you want them to feel, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable on stage, you can't be afraid of speaking from the heart. And this is more for the, uh, the uh, male, attendance, male attendance of this workshop, which is something I struggled in the past. And it's, it is to get rid of toxic masculinity, which unfortunately, unfortunately doesn't allow us to sometimes properly express how we should be expressing ourselves. And by doing this, we can be the emotion we want others to feel. Now, we arrive at the third multiplier, which is the message. And once again, we have a question for this. How do you make an impact? What will the audience remember? What will the audience take home with them after you deliver your speech? You just need to talk about something that resonates with you, that is important to you. And, uh, well, it can be something you believe in, something that is important for you, or something that really changed your life. And most important of all, something that makes you excited, makes you eager to share it with others. Something that when you wake up in the morning, before you start preparing your speech, you just think out like, oh, I can't wait to deliver this speech. And if you do this, here's what will happen. 
you will build up so much energy, so much excitement, so much enthusiasm about your speech that it will come a point where you simply, when you start delivering your speech, you will release all that energy and the audience will feel it. So you can take your pick. And when preparing your speech, you can focus on what you want to tell. Like, for example, an achievement you are proud of, someone that did something amazing for you, or even a life-changing event, or one of the biggest challenges in your life. You just need to try to be an impactful messenger. We arrive at the quirkiness, which is one of my favorite multipliers. And once again, we have a question for this multiplier, which is how to make a speech yours. And this might sound a bit controversial. Well, if it is my speech, of course it's mine. What's going on? But I have a question, a thought-provoking question for all of you. What happens if someone else delivers your speech? Will it be the same speech? Will it have the same impact? Well, you have somehow to make sure that your speech is nothing without you. Nothing. It's just a speech. But this speech is nothing without the proper speaker. And how do you make you speak and how do you make a speech yours? This might sound a bit uh, not as impactful as you might have hoped, but just be yourself. Just be quirky. Because sometimes when you have certain postures on stage that are typical for you, when you have something that you really like to do, something that makes you different than others, you can exploit that to make your speech yours. So if you like to dance, just simply dance. If you like to sing, just sing. If you like to wear costumes, just dress up for your speech. And if you like doing silly cartoon voices, just do it. Because that's you. And by doing what you do best and what makes you, you, you make sure that no one else can have as much impact delivering the same speech that you do. So be your quirkiest self. What have we learned? You, we have learned about four different speech multipliers. The gist, which is the essence of the speech, what you need to talk about. The emotion, and most important, that you need to be the emotion that you want others to feel. How to be a messenger and to allow yourself to be quirky on stage. To not be afraid of being who you are, because that makes all the difference when the time comes to deliver a speech. So, I have a final message for you all. Just remember to quickly deliver an emotional message. Well, at least that's the gist of it. Thank you. And now we are in the Q&A part. So, if you have any questions, I'm all open. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, would you stop sh sharing your... Oh, yeah. Sorry. And here's the stop share. Yep. yep. Wonderful. So now we have room for questions. I believe we have questions here. Not really. Anand, go on. I'm going to start. Thank you, Francisco, for this uh, amazing... Uh, uh, sh you shared your experience with us. So I have a question because I'm curious. So you mentioned that you are a shy person. <laughs> so how did you manage to share or show your emotion on the stage? Because it's very difficult. I'm shy also. <laughs> it's very difficult. So you did practice before or it just by years or, or, 
or uh, how did you do that? Well, first, because first, I, uh, when I see you are not a shy person on stage. Thank you, thank you for your question. It's a uh, well, it's gonna be a delight to answer that question because it takes like uh, whew, many it takes me back, it takes me back because the uh, yeah I was I used to be a shy person on stage. I um, I used to shake a lot and. Uh, I would say that the easy answer is, oh, we just took many years of attempting toast, attending Toastmaster sessions to, to get better. But that's not all. The um, One of the reasons why I was shy on stage was because uh, growing up, I was always um, I was always thought, thought to be, uh, by my parents, to be like uh, really stiff and, and sturdy and to not being the, the most uh, emotional person or not, not expressing my emotions so so fluently and uh, when i got to toastmasters um for the first time i i felt that okay i'm in a place i'm in a safe space where i can start by trying to okay let's start to uh just le letting out a tiny bit of emotions just uh, or uh, one emotion at a time just to see how the audience reacts because my reality before those masters was no 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 a man doesn't cry a man is sturdy and uh, well, you get the idea so it, it was thanks to those masters that i started to feel like i was in a place where i could just try and fail over and over again to um okay uh i was sad and I remember the first time I, I said I was sad on stage, the, the first feedback I got, oh, yeah, yeah, you sure you were sad, uh, but yeah, you, um, what you said clearly had nothing to do with the way you reacted. And I remember thinking, oh, no, they, they're going to think I'm a sociopath or, so, or something like that. No, no. Um, but uh, yeah, over and over again, just by listening to the feedback that my uh, my friends and colleagues at the Invicta Toastmasters uh constantly told me and seeing others um the way they express and this is really important seeing other toastmasters um expressing their emotions on stage i felt like oh wait um if they can do it like this maybe i can try to imitate the way they they feel so uncomfortable and they express their image the typical fake it till you make it and uh, eventually, I think it was post-COVID. I think it was for being just closed in, inside my house for so many t for so many months. Uh, you kind of all all the emotions bottled up, and after COVID, it started to get easier to let my emotions out. So it was a bit of Toastmasters, a bit of uh, being being uh, pretty much alone during the pandemic, and uh, it came a point where I just started to easily emote and. Uh, and of course, by by feeling uh, more comfortable with sharing my emotions and talking about my feelings, all the all the feeling shy stuff on stage that it pretty much went away. Uh, went away. Francis, thank you. I have a question here in the chat. What's your advice for people that might be too emotive? or too quirky for the mainstream audience? Is there space for them? That's a really good question. Thank you. It was from, from Sonia. Thank from you, Sonia. Sonia. Yeah. Um, well, too emotive or too quirky? Hmm. That, that, that got me thinking. The, I would say that, um, not trying to repeat myself, but just grabbing what I said before about just uh, testing the waters about uh, when you don't really talk about your feelings and etc. And you start by trial and error, just trying to test the waters and see, oh, can I share this emotion? Oh, yes, I can. They react well. I think we can use that for um, people that are too emotive, too quirky, like you said. Um, because if I want to share something or want to try something at my club, Let's say, for example, oh, I really like to sing. Actually, the for the international international speech contest this year at my club, I started. I in the middle of my speech, I start to sing, and I was like testing the water. Say, okay, is it okay if I start to sing? Is it too awkward? Uh, but before, during some impromptu speeches, I had sang as well. And it was like testing the waters, okay? Uh, people react well to when someone just out of nowhere starts to sing in the middle of the speech. 
and um, it allowed me to check that okay, I can I can sing, or I can introduce singing at a particular level during my speeches because people react well to it. So my advice would be to just grab what you want to show, what you want to introduce in your speech. And if you are not so completely sure that people will react well to it, first dilute it a bit, present it in a speech. And if people react well, then for your next speech, just add a bit more of concentrated quirkiness of our emotion, if you will. It's like going to the gym. You just progressively put on more weights on, on your bars and you start to leave heavier, lift heavier. So yeah, that's my my suggestion. Like a a progressive quirkiness overload, if you if you will. Thank you, Francisco. I have a, another question from Marlin. What is your method of preparation? Is there some exercise you can recommend for loosening up? Do you test your speeches in self tapping or trying things out with friends? Thank you, Marilyn, for your question. Yeah, um, several answers for that question. In terms of exercise for loosening up, um, before, yeah, even when I'm preparing for my speeches, I like to, uh, well, do something silly. We just putting my 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 arms in the air and just go, like, which is like in front of the mirror, so just to feel silly, just to not start to take myself way too seriously. Uh, of course, it depends on the type of speech that you want to to deliver. Uh, but normally, I think it uh, it relaxes. It uh, doesn't make me so stiff. And um, and in terms of uh, warming up my voice and uh, and so on, I just do well. I do something that I often use in my speech, which is trying to imitate cartoons that I used to watch as a kid. So it helps to to warm up the voice to different pitches. So you have a higher pitch, like "Ha ha, it's me, Mickey," something like that, or something like growly and intense, like Darth Vader, something like that. And um, it it uh, breaks character. It makes you feel a bit silly. But like I said, uh, at least for me, what works is before presenting a speech, just making sure I'm not taking myself way too seriously. Um, just just a tiny amount. Uh, what else was in your oh the terms of speech and self taping? Uh, yeah, I record my speeches a lot, either uh, just uh, voice recordings or video recordings. My process normally is uh, I think about, okay, I want to make a speech about uh, this topic, this theme, this gist, if you'll just going back to my presentation. And then my process is like going back and forth, just walking around the house, thinking out loud. And whenever I have like, uh, oh, this, this works really well in this part of the speech, even if I don't have like the whole structure prepared, I just record it. And let's say by the end of the evening, I have like this huge list of recordings that then I hear and then I compile them oh this could be uh, this should go on the introduction this on the conclusion this on the uh, on the first part of the the body of the speech and so on and when in terms of trying things out with friends uh well the only friends I try things out are my toastmasters friends in, when it comes to speeches and um, it comes down to, like I said before, to testing their reaction. Like I said, when I um, started to sing during a speech, it was something I always wanted to do because it's uh, many people are not expecting it. And some go like, huh, what is he doing? Starting to speak, or starting to um, to sing. And uh, yeah, I, every time I have like a different idea, there was one time where I took um, a Captain America shield to... Um, to my club and I was like, okay, let's test the waters. How do people react? Is it way too much? Is it okay? So yeah, whenever I have like a different idea, uh, I recommend not being afraid to trying new things out and just not trying to repeat myself. Those masters feels like a safe place to, to do it. So don't be afraid and uh, just, just try things out. Questions, more questions. No one. I don't bite.
Yeah, I, I will ask a question. What is your process to memorize or to internalize the, the speech? Thank you, Isidro. Uh, I I have to say sometimes it can be can get a bit chaotic, uh, <laughs> but um, one thing I try to do is to at least during the the initial preparation of the speech or the when I am conceiving the speech or crafting it, I normally just focus on three main things: the um, the power a powerful introduction and conclusion, and those normally are the the first things I write down. And once they, once I'm happy with them, and once I memorize them, because they typically are the shortest parts of the of the speech, right? The, in, the introduction, the conclusion, the, the rest is well, the the bigger part of the, the cake, if you will. Um, then I focus on just writing initially bullet points, bullet points about okay, what's the content of the speech, and initially. I just try to initially not necessarily improvise, but trying ideas. Just okay, if I if I want this topic, this topic, and this topic in the body of the speech, let's try this. Let's try that, and then I just go around the house, like speaking, talking out loud, and trying new new ideas and new things. And once I'm happy with like this bunch of ideas, I just organize them, and after that, I just um, Re, I wouldn't say reread because I don't actually write the whole speech, just the, the introduction, the conclusion, and some bullet points. But once I have all the, the structure and, uh, and all the ideas aligned, I just uh, repeat the speech over and over again. And I first, uh, and when I'm happy with what I'll call it the, uh, the beta speech or the alpha speech, uh, which is predates the final one. Uh, when I'm when I when I think that okay, this is a really this is a really fine first attempt. I record it and I have an audio file on my phone with the first attempt at the speech I want to deliver. Then I listen to it and then I iterate over it, just say it again out loud and try to, at the same time, try to improve upon it. Just add more pauses, add more vocal variety. And then when I'm happy with the whole uh, spoken speech, if you will. Then I start to record myself in video to see if the gestures, the uh, the usage of the stage, are in sync with what I want to say. So I, I would say, first write, then navigate around the house, record uh, record my voice or my my ideas in in audio, and then finally just record me just delivering a speech like I was on stage believe that you you have people living with you and calling you crazy right oh and, yeah uh, all the time <laughs> yes that's what happened i have a, a question from duarte how do you let yourself to be yourself on stage are there some is there some process to to do it thank thank you Duarte, for your question um yeah certainly there's a process and it's a, a progressive process it doesn't happen overnight um and speaking from experience it took quite a while to um, first to feel comfortable on stage and after feeling comfortable on stage only then did i uh, like i said previously started to test things out just because uh, like i said my background before toastmasters was uh, no emotions, uh, typical uh, no emotion, no tears kind of person. And uh, I was during many, many years uh, not sure uh, how far I could go uh, in terms of um, expressing uh, myself, just allowing to be myself in front of others. And Toastmasters really helped that by uh, showing me and by watching other Toastmasters pretty much doing the same. So I would say me being myself on stage is a byproduct of seeing other Toastmasters that started before me doing the same and realizing that it's okay. It's okay to be yourself on stage because you are in a place, at least in Toastmasters, where nobody's going to judge you. And 
being yourself comes as an advantage because there is nobody else like yourself. So even if you deliver a speech that was already delivered by someone else, you can always put a spin on it just by being yourself. Either, either if you move differently on stage, even if you uh, are one of those, those people like me that really deeply stares in your eyes when they are talking to the point that people start looking away because they feel uncomfortable. Uh, it comes with time, it comes with practice, but the first thing you have to remember is at least in Toastmasters, you can do it. You can progressively allow yourself to be yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Fellow Toastmasters, please don't be shy. While you are thinking in your questions, I will ask Francisco another question. Well, Please. Francisco, this is me, Javier, from Mexico City. Yes, yeah. Well, great. Uh, congratulations, great, great uh, speech. I think what's well, just a comment or, or something, uh, I think you have to be yourself. When you are yourself, it's so you feel comfortable when you're speaking. Sometimes when you, you, you're trying to be, you know, I want to be, <laughs> I know, happy or, or, you know, funny. If you're not funny, it's very exactly. difficult to connect. Yeah. I think be yourself. When you be yourself, you can connect. Well, it's just my personal point of view. And uh, also, uh, how to connect? Well, Maybe you have to be a little bit just like a psychologist. If you are in a in in a in a place where there are many uh, greens like color, you know, very uh, technical, you have to maybe you have to put a suit, or maybe if you are with uh, with centennials, maybe you have to put some sneakers. I don't know. Well, what what's your opinion? You know, you have to connect when you connect with the guys. And also, well, for me, it's very difficult because I'm green. If I'm green, I'm technical. I'm not. It's it's very difficult to be funny, maybe. But well, what's your point of view, Francisco? And thank you, Javier. Uh, yeah, it's a really good point of view. It's a really good point of view. Of course, when you try to connect with the audience, it's uh, it's hard to connect with everyone at the same level. It's it's really hard. It's uh, my, my my short answer is just uh, do your best and hope for the best. But mm -hmm. yeah, the um, it's um, it's impossible to um, to connect with everyone at the very same level. It's uh, some people just prefer uh, when you are more like them. Other people not so much, and. Um, it's a really hard question to answer, and thank you for that because it get, it get, gets me thinking, and I really like when my brain starts to go. Brrr. Um, and um, I would say that the best way, and sorry if this, and sorry if this doesn't answer your question completely, but at least for me, the best way or the way I feel most comfortable or most achieved when trying to connect with the audience is. Reading the audience, okay, knowing how much I can, uh, let's say, how much of a top a topic I can share with the audience and not of, offend them, but at the same time trying to trying to stay true, uh, sorry, trying to stay true to myself. So you can't win them all. It's my it's my uh, my short version. And if you have to change your attire, if you have to. Uh, to change the essence of who you are, mm -hmm. maybe it starts to disconnect with the audience in another way. Because even if you, for example, oh yeah, some people like to or prefer if, uh, or just giving a silly example, oh, uh, my audience all likes to uh, wear blue. I'd say like our dress in blue clothes, mm -hmm. clothes. And I'm really a black and white kind of guy. Uh, okay, how can I connect with the audience like this? Do I change my preferred way of dressing? Do I start to dress blue as well? Or do I find a way to make them comfortable with me being different? 
For example, I would start my, my speech. Sorry to all your blue fanatics. I'm colorblind, so sorry. I have no idea what I'm dressing. It's a silly example, really silly example. But I, uh, at the same time, I know that we, we can't connect with everyone at the same level. But I think there's always a little bit of hope that we can find a middle, a middle, uh, we can meet a, uh, in the middle of the way and at least find something that at least makes them <laughs> chuckle. It was funny or something like that. So it might not, might not be easy, but there's, I think there's always something we can do to at least connect a tiny little bit with even with the ones that are most different from, from us. Once again, sorry if it doesn't completely answer your question. It's a tough one. But uh, thanks again for asking you. Francisca, I have a beautiful message here. Uh, it's a question and a message. Marlene, is your winning speech from the Tangier conference available online? The question. And then she says, without understanding a word of Portuguese, I was blown away. I would love to see it again to try to analyze your secret sauce. And let me tell you before you answer that I do understand Portuguese and I was blown away too. So uh, is it online? Uh, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. Uh, but I, um, well, I have a phone with a camera. I still know the speech by heart, so I can, I can record it and uh, make it available. So, uh, yeah, I was actually surprised the other day. Uh, it was uh, here at a club in Portugal. They asked, oh, the, we didn't have the chance to, to see our winning speech. You want to come over and do it again? I was like, OK, sure. But uh, do I remember it? And I was like, the two days before I was, OK, let's let's see if I still remember the speech. And it was like, uh, oh, wow, I still know the speech by heart like it was yesterday that I, that I was competing. And uh, I guess just saying the speech so many times is just... Uh, just gets stuck in your mind. So yeah, I have uh, I have no problem. Actually, it, it is on my to-do list to have like a really, I wouldn't say really fancy recording, but at least a really well well edited recording um, of the speech because it was a winning speech. And the only thing I have is, I think it was a audio message I sent to my mentor uh, the first time I uh, prepared the speech for the competition at the club, uh, our club at Invicta. So yeah, the uh, the only online remnant of the speech right now, <laughs> it's a WhatsApp voice message. So yeah, I'll I'll be sure to to record it at least post it on. I have a YouTube channel that uh, it's uh, I thought I haven't uploaded a single video since 20, 2010. So it was before the uh, all the YouTubers started to uh, to appear. So uh, but yeah, I'll. I'll be sure to do that is on my bucket list and um, then I can make it available. Yeah. And thank you for, for enjoy, enjoying my speech. It's, um, I would say the secret sauce, uh, oof, this kind of sounds really bad, but the secret sauce was me. So <laughs> just, yeah, uh, yes. yeah just um, come, comes back, comes around to, or comes full circle to what I've been saying all along, which is just, uh, just being with Toastmasters, feeling comfortable, to start learning how to be yourself and uh because my speech it was about the uh i don't know don't, don't know if you guys can notice but i have a birthmark here between my my lips and, and my nose so with a beer it's hard to to notice but it's like uh this part like here so it was really fortunate because if it if i ended up with a birthmark like this i would end up like a, a really not so famous or overly famous uh nazi german um person so yeah um typical portuguese commentary oh yeah well, i was so lucky not to have so much bad luck um but yeah the speech was about like uh, overcoming um difficulties in my life when i was a kid when i was a teenager about the comments other people have how i felt like a not, not necessarily inferior but uh, how i felt ugly and etc and um that's one of the th one of the reasons why during my presentation I said you have to talk about something that uh, you have a passion about something that impacts you because for in in my example I talked about me uh, surpassing the how uncomfortable I was with the thing I was born with and I since it was something that took a lot of work a lot of years to finally feel comfortable uh, all the emotion behind it was 
was raw, was natural, uh, and that uh, we are empathic creatures. And that is no, when you when people hear you uh, talk with passion, they they notice. They notice when your voice trembles when you are talking about struggle. They notice the way you smile when you are referring to someone you love, and those subtle subtle hint, hints are in my opinion what makes the difference and you are the one that makes a difference in your own speech because you are you and your experiences are yours alone and that can be used to to write a really powerful uh, speech if no one has any other question i will end with a challenging question for you oh wait uh, i think Rui has a question oh yeah uh, Rui. oh yeah if you can please share a bit of more about the structure of a speech do you have a specific structure you usually follow do you let it flow how do you decide the structure for the structure are you decide the structure of your speech of your speech thank you Rui. It's a really good question, and I hope it fo I, f I can follow that with a really good answer. In terms of the uh, the structure, the um, for I I'd say it depends on the goal the of the speech or the gist. Once again, uh, just grabbing my my Portuguese speech from last year's contest as an example. If it is, for example, a speech about um, a personal experience, what I usually like to do is, okay, it's a personal experience, but first, is it something um, relatable? Is it something uh, impact, uh, that can cause an impact on the audience? Is it something that will make the audience feel something? Because, for example, this year, when I was preparing for this year's competition, I was like, oh, what a tragic story did my life ended up having for this past week, for this past year? And the only thing I managed to think about was, oh, I had a knee surgery. I was like, I'm not making a, a speech about the knee surgery. Nobody will want to hear that. Um, but let, during last year, when I was preparing my speech, um, I thought, okay, I have this, this topic. And... How can I say it in a way, or can I craft a speech in a way that grabs the audience's attention from the beginning to the end and wants them and makes them want to to hear more during the the body of the speech? And one thing I really like to do, I really like, and this is my personal opinion, it's something I really like to do in my speeches, which is I like to go full circle. I like to just plant the seeds of curiosity in uh, in the introduction. So that people um, are for saying in other words, I like to drop some keywords in the introduction, keywords that I will refer later during the body of the speech, because there's a some some people say that repetition is key. If it's way too 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 much repetition, our grammarian starts to to look suspicious. But um, when you repeat some words uh, throughout the speech. Uh, people notice that because it, it is catchy. So I like to drop some keywords in the, inter, in the introduction. And uh, during the body of the speech, I like to introduce, do a short, I have the introduction, then I do a short of uh, ramp up before presenting uh, a problem or a situation that caused, uh, caused me to feel something or cause another situation to, to happen. And then I just... If the, the speech was like a curve, I start like this and I go to the climax of the speech, which is when the problem just uh, was in such a way it, it was so intense that it had to be resolved. And then I start to just going down, just decreasing the intensity and just explaining how the, uh, the problem was solved. Normally during this downhill part is the most emotional part uh, of the speech. And by the end, I like to, when I do a conclusion, I like to just refer, not entirely, but refer to some of the main keywords of the, the introduction. So that if the introduction has some keywords that were repeated throughout the speech, and if the conclusion has at least one or two of those keywords uh, in the conclusion, 
uh, then people, since they heard those keywords and uh, the theme behind that, those keywords during the whole speech, when you land the conclusion, normally the reaction I, I want to cause in the audience is like, whoa. Because people were like, oh, yeah, it comes, it makes perfect sense the way he ended the, the speech like that. And uh, I was trying to, to think of uh, an example on the fly. Oh, yeah, for example, I... Um, and I remember, I remember that when you you asked, do you let it flow? Yeah, sometimes as well. But just to give a practical example, there was a speech that I made. Um, there was a new Toastmasters club, is a prospect a prospect club now, which is um, Valdo Souza Toastmasters, and I was asked to I was asked to do a speech there, and uh, the speech I ended up using was one I did for last year's English competition. And when I was preparing that speech, I it was a, spe a speech about um, my first job experience and how uh, the feedback in the company I worked for was terrible. And when I joined Toastmasters, I learned what proper feedback was like. And the the whole structure of the speech was like that. Oh, everything was fine and great. Then this situation happened, and I was really, really, it was really, really bad for me. And then the solution started to arrive, and uh, the emotional part, uh, the emotional part of the speech kicks in. But in the introduction, I made a metaphor about um, a sailor. Like, oh, just imagine a sailor that he ha is surrounded by a literal sea of opportunities, and then he's hit by a, by a storm, is knocked out of his boat, and starts drowning. And the whole introduction was a metaphor for that. And right after the introduction, I just go like this. Oh, you know, you you are probably wondering if this introduction was all it was only a metaphor, and people start laughing because, of course, they start to they started to think about it, and then the rest of the speech, like I said, follows a typical scenario of going up, 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 just talking about the problem or the build up to the problem, and when the problem happens, then we go downhill with the more emotional part of the speech, but by the end, in the conclusion of the speech, and having in mind that during the body of speech, I I didn't touch on anything um, Navy or sailor related. But in the conclusion, I just went full circle. And I don't remember it all that well, but I was able to just to focus on what the content of the speech was, which was surpassing a situation. And in the conclusion, it was something along the lines of, oh, and then I, uh, I regained the strength to swim back up, take control of my boat, and uh, challenge all the storms that came my way. And when then people said, "Oh, it's going going full circle," and I went ahead and said, "And if you join Toastmasters, you you will how did I went ended it? Oh yeah, uh, you will learn how on stage just to properly sail away, something like that, which is just to point out that." The introduction had some keywords about sailing. The whole body of the speech was nothing related to to sailing or just uh, getting lost at lost at sea. But in the conclusion, I was able to grab some of those keywords, the theme, the metaphor that I introduced introduced in the in in the intro. Uh, trying to not sound so redundant, um, and I was able to reuse the metaphor. But since the audience was already had already heard the content of the speech about surpassing a difficult situation, I was ready. I was able to reuse some of the keywords uh, about that I use in the in the metaphor in the introduction to make them realize, oh, it it has been this has been connected all along, and and the the speech in an impactful way. We have a last question here from Marilyn. Have you ever delivered a really serious topic and found a way to lighten it with humor without trivializing the topic? Thank you, Marilyn, for that question. Uh, yes, yes. And it was actually during the uh, last year's speech, the Portuguese, when I won the Portuguese speech contest. Uh, when I was uh, during, there was a part of my speech where, um, let me try to recall it properly, where I, it was kind of a contrary. I was just, the audience was was thinking, oh, it's going to be a lightweight, uh, a really light, lightweight uh, speech when it comes to emotions. And 
they uh, there was a part of the speech where I started to to imitate some voices from our colleagues that had some colorful ideas or nicknames for for me due to my my birthmark and the way I said it uh, was causing some mixed reactions in the public because they were laughing due to the typical the voices I was doing and the way I was expressing myself on stage but then I get but uh, really after that I just said oh but you guess what? Uh, after that, I went home and cried. And it was really interesting. It's, it's not exactly what you are asking, but it's um, it's uh, an impact that causes the audience to try to control themselves because what, what really ended up happening, it was really interesting to see. I had not foreseen that reaction in the audience, but since they were laughing, they were laughing, but at the same time, oh, we are laughing about this, but it was an unfortunate event. And I follow when I followed that with a sentence that oh, and all those things that you are laughing about made me cry. The audience just just gets silenced, and you can see some people just trying not to laugh because they feel bad about it. And it was one interesting impact I had not foreseen the that impact, but then I knee I kneeled on that. And um, what works for me when talking about something so serious is always a bit, and this, this doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone is, is uh, as comfortable as doing that. And not to brag, of course, but it's uh, self-depreciating humor, which is not taking yourself way too serious. Okay, I'm talking about something serious, but if I do something slightly silly or sometimes it's just a hand gesture and, and people just see that as something that is, okay, I was not expecting him to to be silly in this point, and they feel more relaxed because they see that okay, it's, that it's something tense that he's talking about. But since he's not taking himself way too seriously, seriously, since he did like a silly gesture or a silly voice, um, the audience gets a bit more relaxed, and which for me I think it's important because you don't you don't want to make your audience feel. Um, uncomfortable the whole speech you might have parts of your speech where it's important if the audience feels if the audience feels uncomfortable like i said the situation where i was imitating voices about nicknames for my birthmark and then i said i was crying and people start, started to oh i shouldn't be laughing about this but by using a little bit of humor and self-depreciating humor not to the point of of um, feel sorry for me that's not the goal the objective is more like I am mature enough uh, um, so that I, even I, can feel comfortable about joking a little bit about this. And people catch up on that. They see, oh, okay, he's mature enough to uh, play with this idea, to not feel, feel so constricted, not feel so ashamed of something. And it lightens up the mood. So you, I would say humor in tiny doses. Thank you, Francisco. Here's a round of applause for, to Francisco, please. So, Claudia, I will. Thank you. I will hand the session to you, and so that you can pass it to Hanan. The floor is yours, Claudia. Yes, thank you. Fabulous, wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Francisco, for for sharing such great insights. I didn't have a chance to witness your speech. So I'm just like others, you know, curious to know, um, yeah, when we could see it again. I was in Wolfgang's in the Spanish competition during that time, but we heard you, <laughs> but we heard your speech. Um, so now I would like to hand it over to Hanan and she will let us know when the next Winners Academy webinar will be held. Over to you, Hanan. Thank you. Next guest is going to be Achil. Achil Tukta. He is a member of Madrid Toastmasters Club and he is the World Championship semi finalist last year. So, uh, this uh, we hope it's not the last session of the Winners Academy and it's going to be next uh, Thursday. It's going to be also an, uh, a night session. And since I received lots of requests about all the Winners Academy recordings, 
It's going to be after a free podcast session. All the, the winners academy, you're going to find them on the YouTube channel of the District 107. So stay, stay tuned and we, I hope to see you all uh, with Akhim Kofta. Thank you very much. And back to you, Claudia. Great. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you next week. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank, Thank you again. You.